but we have a friend of mine for close to 30 years, and I have spoken with Jim. He's come to a lot of my meetings when I've done evangelism and, and shared some amazing things, and, and it's with great pleasure and a great honor that we welcomed him to Mount Vernon to have him be able to come and share. It's like, well, it used to be like talking to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now it's like talking to Wiki or Google or whatever it is out there. All the knowledge that he has and to share that with us. And, and there's never enough time, but I hope you've been blessed listening to him. It's my friend Jim Burr. And one of the greatest greatest things that I can say about Jim Burr is everything he does, everything he studies, everything he shares is filtered through the eyes of a Christian. He loves Jesus very much, and he studies to share Jesus in a clearer way. I did tell him that we go to about 1230, about 1220, what they do is they start cooking the stuff downstairs, warming it up, so the smell starts coming up and permeating the congregation. And it's really hard to keep people's attention when, when that food is smelling really good. So uh, I tell you, but you don't probably have to look at the clock. When you start smelling and, and your stomach starts growling, but you won't want him to stop when he starts sharing all the wisdom. When he starts sharing, the, I pick on him a little bit about how, how uh, we both go a little longer than we plan. And so we can tease each other. But when he gets started, I never like him to stop. So it's a great pleasure I introduce my friend, Jim Burr. Thank you, Chuck. It's good to be here. The reason you get all this wisdom is when you get as old as I am, you know, you accumulate all this stuff. <laughs> I'm starting my 83rd trip around the sun. One of the benefits you get living on Earth, you get a free trip around the sun every year, you know. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's good to be here. And uh, we're going to talk about dinosaurs of all things. And you know, it's interesting because kids, get co little boys particularly, my little four-year-old grandson, he can rattle off probably 20 dinosaur names of all the different dinosaurs. Why is it little boys? Girls don't pay much attention, but little boys, they get caught up. And you know something? Satan has used dinosaurs to convince children and adults that evolution is true. One of the biggest effective units yeah, I believe he has is this idea that dinosaurs have evolved into chickens, for one thing, and uh, the belief in evolution. Satan has just done everything he can do. And uh, I don't know why they, these kids get so caught up in this, but anyhow, we're going to move right into our program. Uh, here you see a T-Rex and a man. I should first say that I believe that God created the biosphere and all life on earth in six literal 24-hour days less than 10,000 years ago. That's what I believe, and that I believe in Noah's flood. It's sad but true. Dinosaurs are probably used more than anything else in an attempt to convince children and adults alike that evolution is true. Um, T-Rex is the ultimate killing machine. T-Rex, they say, would eat everything it could catch. Would eat everything. In the Garden of Eden? In the Garden of Eden? When everything was good, every day of creation was good. It was very good. When he got done, it was very good. In the Garden of Eden, the dinosaurs did exist. Therefore, they must somehow fit into the biblical narrative. The biblical frame. They did exist. We know that. There's a group of people who said, oh, they didn't exist. They didn't exist. That was just Satan's uh, deception. But no, they did exist. And I've seen enough bones of dinosaurs to know they did exist. So they somehow have to fit into the biblical narrative. Now, the Bible talks about some dinosaurs. But the mean ones. The Bible doesn't talk about the mean ones. The Bible talks about the ones that ate grass. You see here what it says. In Job 40, verse 15, look at Behemoth, which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like the ox. In, in 40, verse 17, its tail is like a cedar tree, and its thighs are thick, and it eats grass like an ox. Uh, and so we see the Brontosaurus, and 
uh, some of these that are uh, plant eaters. But, um, and the Bible talks about, it was interesting that reptiles never stop growing. Reptiles never, they never stop growing. You and I reach a certain point and that's it. But dinosaurs never stop growing. And the Bible talks about behemoth. Leviathan is mentioned about six times in scripture. So God created some of these peaceful, big, huge <laughs> creatures, but peaceful ones that eat grass, okay? And so the ultimate killing, T-Rex is the ultimate killing machine in the Garden of Eden. You know, the Bible tells us that the earth was corrupt before God. I mean, here we are in Genesis 6, and it had already become corrupt. And it was filled with violence, and the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast. God is going to destroy. And God saw how corrupt the earth was in verse 12. For every creature had corrupted its way on the earth. 12 verse 16. Does this look like God's creatures or Satan's creature? I don't think that looks like something God would, would create. The fields, and the, because the Bible talks about heaven and, and the, you know, the animals and the... the, the well, here's some scripture. The fields you plow will be free of rocks. Wild animals will never attack you. The wolf will live with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the young lion, and the little child will lead them. And so we see heaven is going to be no more sorrow or tears or crying and no more hurt, but this has, well, I think you're going to be amazed as we move forward here today. Well, some say that the dinosaurs were peaceful. They were not, folks. The dinosaurs were not peaceful. Uh, we know this because we look at the skeletons and uh, the violence of Jurassic Park was not far from the truth. Dinosaurs' life was one of violence. It was a viol violent. We know that because we see all the broken bones in dinosaurs where they have tried to reheal. The bones were not broken in their death but like rib bones have tried to reheal, and you get a big knot there where they try to reheal. It must have been terribly painful. They were fighting. I think they were bred and designed to fight. Uh, so the dinosaur life was one of violence. T Rex, now the, there's, uh, there's a, uh, a female T Rex called Sue. And Sue had many injuries to her leg, her tail, her skull, and ribs. She had multiple broken ribs on both sides that had tried to reheal. This is one dinosaur, had multiple broken ribs. T Big Al is one of the biggest ones. He's not the biggest one. We've just discovered that Scotty now that's 20,000 pounds. Big Al was the biggest with about 18,000 pounds. And uh, from the Morrison for Formation in Wyoming, and he had 19 skeletal abnormalities. Most dinosaurs seem to have broken and rehealed injuries. So we know they were violent because of their body was broken up. And it, they must have been in, in, in terrible suffering to have, you know how bad if you just even sprain a rib, I mean, or, or break a rib, I mean, it is unbelievable, painful to think that many, multiple, both sides too, both sides of her body had broken ribs that had rehealed. And, uh, God said to them, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fall of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. How are you going, is Adam going to have dominion over this? How is he going to have dominion over this? Well, the ballistics people tell us an AK-47 will not take out a big T-Rex. The ballistics people tell us you need a rocket RPG, a rocket-propelled grenade. So if T-Rex was in the Garden of Eden, I'm suggesting that God needed orientation 101. Adam and Eve, listen up. This is life or death. Two things, life or death. Don't eat of the tree. Adam, you better get an RPG. You better get, learn how to use this thing. And Eve, you, Eve, you better hang around near Adam because an AK-47 is 50-50 chance. It's you or him. You need something bigger than an AK-47. You need an RPG. Well, we do this in the video. Uh, kind of a fun thing where I actually have a mock-up of an RPG. <laughs> we're working, we're reshooting the video now, but you're going to need something like that to take out T-Rex. If the dinosaurs had survived, none of the wonderful creatures, it wouldn't be a horse on the planet or a cow or a deer or an elk. If 
they would eat everything they could catch and they would have destroyed all of God's wonderful creatures that you see here had they survived. And some Christians say, well, God could have created them to eat grass with 60 teeth, 10 inches long. Does this look like something you could eat grass with? Okay, look at the herbivores that are designed to eat grass. We have a list here. The deer, the elk, the bison, the sheep, the goats, the camels, the llamas, the alpacas, the gurus, the wildebeest, the giraffe, the yak, the musk ox, the buffalo, rhinoceros, pronghorns, and reindeer, and cows. They all have teeth in the front on the bottom. They don't have top front. They got chewing teeth in the back for chewing their cud. But don't tell me, I don't believe that T-Rex was designed to eat grass. Now, there was, I think God did a miracle. This is so exciting. Um, this, is, this is a femur, MOR1125, from the Hell Creek Formation of a, a femur, big dinosaur femur, that was discovered in Wyoming. And uh, Dr. Mary Schweitzer was there with Dr. Jack Horner. And Mary Schweitzer had an electric drill, and she says, man, I can hardly wait. I want to drill and see what's inside this femur. And Jack Horner freaked out. You're, there is no, pale, no pale, paleontologist in the right mind is going to deface this sacred treasure of mankind, this femur. We're not going to mess with this femur. Are you crazy? What kind of a paleontologist are you, Mary Schweitzer, Dr. Mary Schweitzer? Oh, I just want to know what's inside. She was interested in other areas of, of science where they want to save this bone or re-put it in some museum, right? Well, you know what, God, I believe God did a miracle. They got a big helicopter. You see the bone is broken there. Okay, they got a Chinook. I mean, those Chinook, you know, they would take how many soldiers they put on a Chinook. I mean, these things can lift, I think, a 9,000 pounds, so they weren't messing around. And they wrapped this femur in plaster. We got to protect this thing. They wrapped it and put plaster all around it, got their ropes, got the helicopter. Guess what? It fell out of the sling and broke in half. I think God did that. I think the, God, the Lord said, I've had enough of this. Dinosaurs 65 million years ago, living 65, 68, I think God did a miracle because they had carefully tried to wrap this thing in plaster and put a sling around it, and yet it fell out and broke. And you can see the break, you can see the break here in the bone. It broke in several pieces. And Dr. Jack Horner says, okay, Mary, now you can get your sample, I guess. Well, it fell out, yes, and broke apart. And then Mary Schweitzer discovered all of this stuff in the dinosaur bone and uh, red blood cells. 65 million years in a rock. You're going to have a, a fossil, a chunk of rock. And, at night, and uh, this was 2000 when they first discovered her working on this. But in 2007, Dr. Schweitzer and her team identified red blood cells and hemoglobin in fragments of collagen in the tissue of the T. rex femur. And evolutionists go like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> Evolution is here what the evolutionists say. Uh, evolutionary science claim it is impossible that they would, and they would never believe that soft tissue could be formed in the T Rex because the fossil was 65 million years old. They wouldn't accept it. But it went around the world. It was revolutionary, the idea. They actually have stretchable tissue and hemoglobin and red blood cells in this femur. But I think. That was an act of God. So we've also found carbon-14 in dinosaur bones. Well, carbon-14, you can't test anything back maybe more than 50,000 years. Carbon-14, it depletes. It depletes over time. And uh, it really isn't effective. Uh, it just only works in you know, 20, 30,000 years. Well, they have found, they have dozens of bones they have sent out, and they didn't tell them, they're dinosaur bones, but dozens have sent out and uh, to prove they're not 65 million years old. But what's really interesting, the, uh, this is the uh, Center for Applied Isotope Studies at the University of Georgia. 
And the guy got really upset when he discovered what they're doing. And uh, so I'll read from him. The scientist at CAIS, that is the Center for Applied Isotope Studies at the University of Georgia, um, the scientists at CIS, CASI and I are dismayed by the claims that you and your team have made with respects to the age of the Earth and the validity of biological evolution. This is uh, from Mike at New Geology. Consequently, we no longer are able to provide radiometric service in support of your anti-scientific agenda. Carbon-14 is anti-scientific. They said, we're not testing any bone, more bones and moreover, we're sending back the bones you just sent us. Don't try to send us any more bones. We're not going to test them for, because of your anti-scientific agenda. Um, I have instructed the radiocarbon laboratory to return your recent samples to you and to not accept any future samples for analysis. We don't, we don't, <laughs> we're not going to do it because you're against science, claiming that the Earth is not 60, dinosaurs are not 65 million years old. Dr. Schweitzer's discovery generated international headlines. T-Rex is basically a big chicken. They say today T-Rex is a big chicken. Evolved. Chickens have evolved, birds have evolved. So Johnny comes home from school. Mom, did you know that birds are living dinosaurs? Do you know this morning? I got woken up by a, a dinosaur was crowing out in the backyard. A rooster crowed. He's a dinosaur. Woke me up by a dinosaur. You see, and we can't accept that when we, if we believe in creation. We believe a God who made it. The teacher said birds evolved from dinosaurs and the similarities between the birds and dinosaurs are undebatable today. It's almost indisputable. Birds and are dinosaurs. You could argue that we still live in the age of dinosaurs. This is Mark Norell, curator of American Museum of Natural History. Now, not every paleontologist buys this chicken dinosaur thing, but the vocal ones, and most, many of them, most of them, I think, do, and he goes on to say, bird lungs are about twice as efficient as mammals, according to Norell, and it seems that dinosaurs shared the same type of respiratory system. Evolutionary scientists say the latest research reinforces the long-held idea that birds and dinosaurs are one and the same. How do a Christian respond to that? What answers do you have for Johnny? Johnny comes home every day with new evidence. Evolution, uh, have, they have, I have a list of 40 reasons that you could cite that birds and chickens evolved from dinosaurs, lizards, alligators. Um, so Johnny comes home, what do you tell Johnny? Okay, and here Johnny comes home with a new chart from the teacher. Johnny says, look at this, Mom, look at this. Here's the birds or dinosaur evolved from dinosaurs. We see dinosaurs that have beaks like a parrot. They have legs like an ostrich. They, we have duck-billed dinosaurs like ducks. The web feet dinosaur like ducks. The dinosaurs lay eggs, and so do chickens lay eggs. Dinosaurs brood on their eggs, and so do chickens brood their eggs. Dinosaurs sleep in the same position that the that chickens do. Uh, they go on and on. Do you know that dinosaurs have wishbones? Chickens have wishbones. Dinosaurs have wishbones. Chickens have gizzards with rocks. Dinosaurs have gizzards. You see the rocks that they've recovered in number 11. They've recovered rocks here. Because dinosaurs have gizzards, they have wishbones, they have hollow bones like birds. You see the illustration, the bones aren't complete, but they're lattice work inside like Swiss cheese. Oh, and we have Triceratops. Looks like he was bred part of a, a cassowary bird, has this rock, this funny looking thing on the top, and so does uh, Triceratops. And then we have uh, uh, we have uh, dinosaurs that look like alligator tails and alligator mouth, and we have dinosaurs that have the neck like an ostrich, and they have feet like a chicken, three-toed, with one coming out the back, and 40 pairs of chromosomes, just like uh, birds and, and dinosaurs have both, and we see similarities in DNA, and there you see on number 15, you see uh, the uh, uh, horn on, we see on Triceratops, and human arms. <laughs> Look at the human arms on this guy. Little tiny, nobody can explain those arms. Nobody. Evolution, 
They're useless. They won't even reach his mouth. How can he catch anything? Because he can't even get food up to his mouth with those tiny little hands. So it's crazy. It's crazy. The vessels and the contents are similar to, in all respects to the blood vessels recovered from an ostrich bone, Dr. Schweitzer reported. And Johnny comes home and says, look at here. There's another picture. There's ten skeletal similarities between birds and dinosaurs. This is like part of the 40 pieces of evidence we have. And uh, so what are you going to tell Johnny? Johnny comes home and says, birds evolved, and you believe in God and believe in a creator. But Johnny says they have evolved. What are you going to tell Johnny? You got an answer for Johnny. Well, they didn't live 65 million years old. We know that, right? That's, you don't have a lot of answers. It's like we're whack-a-mole. They've got 40, actually more like 50. They've got 40, 50, 40 reasons that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And the Christians were out here like trying to deal with all these. What do we do? Whack-a-mole. And the evolution says, we got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. What are you going to tell Johnny, okay? Next day, Johnny says, oh, I love dinosaurs. I love dinosaurs. I'll be able to have a pet dinosaur in five or maybe ten years. They're actually going to make, they're making dinosaurs. I'm going to have a pet dinosaur. They are making GMO, genetically modified dinosaurs. A teacher told us a group from Harvard and Yale just recently were able to actually reverse engineer the bird snout back into a dinosaur snout. Harvard and Yale. Another article in Science News, when it comes to DNA, crocodiles and birds flock together. All this evidence, how do we overcome Satan trying to convince our kids in evolution? What do you tell Johnny? Another day, Johnny comes home, God, I just checked a book out from the library. Look at this, Dr. Jack Horner is making a dinosaur from a chicken egg. You kind of call it chicken asaurus. What are you gonna tell Johnny? Extinction doesn't have to be forever. How to build a dinosaur from a chicken egg. Renowned paleontologist Jack Horner describes his plans to recreate dinosaurs by calling a chicken a saurus. Here's his chicken a saurus. He's working on creating a chicken from a dinosaur egg. And here's what they say. When you take DNA from one organism and insert it into the genome of another, there's theoretically no boundaries on the extent of change that can be accomplished. Dr. Jang Horner has already created strange hybrid creatures with crocodile-like teeth, lizard-like snouts. He says he can finish the job with a dinosaur that acts, walks, looks like a dinosaur, but hatches from a chicken egg. Using genetic markers, we've identified what turns on and makes certain parts. He said the tail on the dinosaur is going to be the most difficult, but what we're doing, we're looking at the gecko. And we would identify the DNA that makes the tail on the gecko, put that into uh, the chicken egg, and we have got a dinosaur. And there's another group that's 50% there already. This next one says, scientists have successfully used reverse evolution to engineer chickens with dinosaur snouts, feet, and even leg bones, using reverse engineering to give modern chickens the features of their ancient dinosaur ancestors. In fact, scientists say that they are positive that they can create a chicken, dino chicken, in the future and are 50% there now. That you can find on newyorktimes.com slash reverse engineering. What are you gonna tell Johnny? We got some answers coming, by the way, coming up here, okay? <laughs> Look at this, Japan. Headlines, human-animal hybrids are now legal to grow in Japan. The Japanese government has granted its approval for the University of Tokyo, Tokyo to proceed with controversial stem cell research project that aims to develop human-animal Frankenstein hybrid creatures from embryo to life as of August 12, 2019. That's nature.com. That just came down six months ago or so. <coughs> Now, in Japan, they used to be they could, had to destroy them, but now they can bring them to full term, human-animal hybrids. And uh, China's doing the same thing. Scientists claim they uh, now use gene editing techniques to create smarter monkeys by making their brains more human-like. That's from MIT Technology. But here it is from China. Scientists in China have created pig monkey chimeras 
looking like baby pigs, but with some primate cells. It's a world first, December 2019, new science reports. Here is a pig chimera that's part, uh, part monkey. So uh, you see what's happening today. Hang on to your hats and fasten your seat belts, folks. I think you will agree what is coming up is revolutionary. There is an answer for Johnny. I think that only Christians have the answer for this. There's an answer coming up. The Bible says, just as in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. We see what's happening today, and the Bible says what happened in the time of Noah is going to happen just before Jesus comes. Does that work both ways? Can we look at what happened today and say, you know what, I think the Bible is talking about what happened in the days of Noah. Is that, is that fair? Is that, is that work? Can you work that backwards? As in the days of Noah? As in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Matthew 24, 37, Luke 17, 27, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. You shall not crossbreed two different kinds of livestock. This is kind of interesting in, in Leviticus 19, 19. The Lord is not in favor of all that. Well, this is a miracle. It was, I mean, a computer that was discovered in the ocean, and uh, it goes back thousands of years. A sophisticated, sophisticated device. They're x-raying this thing. And uh, there's all prestigious, Hewlett Packard and all kind of prestigious institutes are researching this, the x-ray. What I'm getting at is they were very smart. In the days of, before the flood, these people were brilliant. They were brilliant. We went from the uh, Nobel Prize for DNA in 34 years, we were cloning Dolly the sheep. 34 years from the, the Nobel Prize for DNA to cloning the Dolly the sheep, what could you do in 900 years if you lived 900 years? And you, were, you probably had a better brain than we do. Do you think so? <laughs> you think those people God created had the brain a lot better than what we have and live that long, what they could achieve? Well, this is a sophisticated computer, but I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. They were so smart, they were doing GMO, genetically modification. Like today, the dinosaurs were GMO, genetically modified lizards, ostriches, all kinds of birds, alligators, crocodiles, turkle, turtles, mostly egg layers. The dinosaurs were GMO, genetically modified creatures. It is very, it's much easier to take an egg from a lizards lay eggs, turtles lay eggs, all, if you see that, the chart up there, birds lay eggs, alligators lay eggs, crocodiles lay eggs, it's much easier to genetically modify an egg than it is to go into a mammal and take out an ovum and put it in a petri dish and try to reinstall it and have the, the female carry it. But an egg is very easy to genetically modify because you got everything that's gonna hatch and all you gotta do is go in and doctor the DNA, switch some DNA in there. And so the dinosaurs were GNO, GMO, genetically modified lizards, ostriches, all kinds of birds, alligators, crocodiles, turtles, mostly egg players. As in the days of Noah, it's happening today. And we're going to prove this, I believe we'll prove this to you. First, I would like to give you the evidence and show how smart they were. And then we'll give you the evidence for the GMOs, okay? This device is a sophisticated computer, this thing that they found in the ocean uh, down there all corroded. They've been x-raying and there's like 30 different gears in here and all kinds of hands and dials that did all kinds of astronomical stuff. But in, in the interest of time, I'm going to move along on that. We can look around the world and see stuff we can't explain. There's stuff we cannot do today that we see in, in uh, Machu Picchu in, Bur in Bur Bur Bolivia. And uh, this was uh, an Easter Island. And really interesting because the evolution, evolution says that the Stone Age possible, uh, supposedly ended around 3300. Stone Age, 3300. And then we had the Bronze Age, and then about 1200 we, BC, we had the Iron Age. That is totally wrong, folks, if you believe the Bible. The Iron Age started 1200 BC. Guess what? When Adam wasn't even 200 years old, the Iron Age started. In, Gen in Genesis 4:22. 
In Genesis 4.22, Tubal-Cain, according to evolution, the Iron Age started around 1200 B.C. According to the Bible, the Iron Age started when Adam was about 125 years old. The Bible says Tubal-Cain forged all kinds of tools out of bronze and iron. Genesis 4.22, how do you make bronze? It's not easy. You need copper and tin mines. You've got to go mine copper. You've got to mine tin. And uh, the copper and the tin mines, uh, it may contain magnesium, aluminum, nickel, phosphorus, silicon, arsenic, and zinc. I believe there was great technology lost in the time of the flood. But it's interesting because evolution says, you know, uh, we had the Bronze Age, we had the Stone Age, and we had the Bronze Age, and we had the, the Iron Age, and so forth. But the Bible doesn't seem to agree with that. Uh, there are, we have rocks with 200 ton that have been ground so smooth you can't put a business card between the rocks. I mean, we could just go on for the pyramids and, and all this revolutionary stuff. And you know what? The History Channel has a, a, a program. You know what it says? How come they were smarter than we are? How come they were more advanced than we are? We can't do some of this stuff. 200 tons, that's a, a locomotive weighs 200 tons. In Bolivia, we see rocks 400 tons. Four, that's like two locomotives up as high as 12,000 feet in the mountains. We don't have, we can lift 200 tons, but there's no way we can mobilize, we can take a 400 ton rock up to 12,000 foot in Bolivia. And uh, it comes out all the time. New discoveries we can't explain. Uh, look at Petra. Petra. Uh, those, the doorway here was 26 foot tall. Carved out of rock. They, ha they were very, very creative. The Andalusians were so advanced scientifically they could do GMOs. Just last week, the news headlines, 40 ancient mysteries researchers can't explain. Even the application of the most modern technology has failed to unravel. Uh, all the mysteries of the ancients, the pyramids in Peru, 2,000, 4,000 pounds, 200, 400,000 pounds, perfectly cut. I guess I already mentioned that. Programs on the History Channel, how were they so much smarter than we are? The Antediluvians had such great achievements that many people say these unexplainable achievements had to be done by aliens. Over and over again, you read this stuff, they were so advanced, they, we couldn't do that. They're the cavemen, right? They're inventing the wheel. It must have been aliens. It must have been aliens came here and did this technology because we can't do it. Uh, and it's what's interesting at the Tower of Babel. What does God say at the Tower of Babel? Let us go down and confound them language, else nothing will be impossible to them. Was God worried about them inventing the wheel 3,300 years ago? Was he worried about them inventing the wheel? What do you think? Nothing. They set their mind out, the scripture says. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Evolution says they were inventing the wheel. <laughs> when God said nothing, they set out be impossible to do. Was he worried about inventing the wheel? We went from the Nobel Prize for DNA to cloning Dolly the sheep in 30, 34 years. What could you do in 900 years? We went from Kitty Hawk, the first air flight, Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, to the moon in 60 years. What could you do in 900 years? If I told you about the airplanes, you wouldn't believe anything else I say, so I'm not going to tell you the evidence that they had actually had airplanes uh, back there, but you can research that on your own. Okay, I believe God has revealed the answer. Here's what you tell Johnny, Amos 3, 7. The Lord says, he does nothing, but he reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Now, I'm no prophet, okay? But the Bible says God is going to reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. You can tell Johnny the T-Rex and the mean dinosaurs were GMO, genetically modified lizards, ostriches, all kinds of alligators, crocodiles, turtles, mostly egg layers. I mentioned it's easy to use eggs. Tell him the mean dinosaurs, okay? The mean dinosaurs were not in the Garden of Eden. They were not on the ark. They didn't live 65 million years ago. The Bible tells us that every creature had corrupted their way. They were not in the Garden of Eden. They were not on the ark, as you'll see as we go along here. The Lord says he does nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophet. 
I found this little book written 150, 155 years ago that has an answer to the GMO issue. In Acts 2, in Joel uh, 17 and two, uh, Joel 2, 28, it says, in the last days, I think we're living in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Dreams and visions, not like Notre Dame or Gene Dixon or Edward Casey, who rely on palm reading and astrology and Ouija boards and, and crystal balls and all kinds of things. God says, he reveals his secrets in dreams and visions, dreams and visions. And uh, do we believe the Bible? The Bible says in the last days there's going to be prophets. Do we believe what the Bible says? Do we accept what the Bible says? And we'll give you the evidence here. Um, I believe God is... Uh, Given to reveal the answer. Does the Christian, do we have any other answer that makes sense except GMO? I believe the only answer that makes sense is genetically modified because we see all these 40 similarities between birds, alligators, crocodiles, turtles, and dinosaurs. We get a little nervous when we talk, <laughs> we talk about prophets because there's so many false prophets, but we're going we're gonna to test a prophet here. Moses said, I wish that all of the Lord's people were prophets. Moses said he wished everybody was prophets and that the Lord would place his spirit on them. And uh, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 14 uh, says, follow charity and earnestly pursue spiritual gifts, but above all that you may prophesy. 1 Thessalonians says, despise not prophesying. Uh, John 14, Jesus said, I have told you before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe it. The Bible is clear dozens of times there will be prophets in the last days. Do the question today, do we believe the Bible? In fact, in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 14, 12 times, 12 times in 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about prophesying, 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 whether you prophesy, whether you prophesy. And uh, if we accept the Bible, let's test. The writer of this book, let's test six. I don't have time. I could do a dozen times, but we're limited on time. Let's do seven tests. I think actually we're going to skip a few and do just five. A vision from, if it was a vision from God, I would expect it to be very specific. You know, Gene Dixon and Notre Dame, these guys, they give these vague prophecies that could fit anywhere. <laughs> but you notice when Daniel... When Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, it was very specific. Daniel, you are the head of gold. Very specific. You're going to see some very specific stuff here, folks. Not general, vague stuff that could be applied to everything. And uh, so, you've all heard of 9-11. You've all heard of 9-11. I got a little book here. It's volume 9. I'm going to read from page 11. This prophet was in New York City and saw the Twin Towers, I believe, in a vision. I believe God gave her a vision of the Twin Towers coming down. And I think you'll see as I read, this is the first test we'll do. And on page 11, men possessed of demons are taking the lives of men, women, and little children. We see you'd have to be possessed with demons to fly into that, those buildings, right? And then going on, she says, on one occasion when in New York City, I was in a night vision, night sees a dream, called upon to see buildings rising, story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof and they were erected to glorify their owners. Higher and still higher, the buildings rose. In them, the most costly material was used. Um, okay, I had that on the screen. I've already read that to you. And... Uh, on one occasion, when she's in New York City, okay, she mentions this higher and higher twice, and she mentions they were, they were warned to be fireproof. The engineers said you could, in those days when they were constructed, a 707 four-engine jet could fly into them. They were certified. In a, a jet lost in the fog, hitting the buildings, would not bring them down. They were certified, and she mentions that twice. And... Uh, both technical calculations and testimony from the World Trade Center, structural engineers confirmed that the two towers were built to withstand the impact of passenger jets to hit them at 9-11. And she's very specific. Buildings rising, story after story, 
toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify their owners. Higher and still higher, these buildings rose, 110 stories. I think she saw this. It sure looks like it. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty, supposedly fireproof buildings and said, they're perfectly safe. But the buildings were consumed as if made of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The, fire, the firemen were unable to operate the fire engines. You know, we had 98 fire engines. Look at this dejected fireman sitting in the front. Windows are knocked out. Look at his face, if you could see it there. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction. The firemen were unable to operate the engines. And uh, 98 fire trucks were, de were destroyed. 343 fire firefighters died in 9-11. And uh, you notice it's very specific. It was in New York where she'd seen it. Well, God gave her a vision about tobacco 90 years before we realized the American Health, uh, Cancer Society. In 1864, okay, she died in 1915. In 1864, the tobacco, tobacco was a slow, she said it was a slow, insidious, most malignant poison. From 1864, it was 90 years bef later, 1957, that the American Cancer Society concluded that smoking was a factor in lung cancer. We're going to get to see what she says about GMOs coming up, okay? But we've got to show you that she's got the track record here that I think you can trust. Um, 90 years, in 1957, American Cancer Society concluded that smoking was a factor in lung cancer. This ad, as late as 1954, this ad was running. A family physician, surgeons, diagnosticians, nose and throat specialists, doctors of every branch of medicine, a total of 113,000 doctors were asked the question, what cigarette do you smoke? More of them named Camel is there smoke than any other cigarette. And doctors prescribed smoking for tuberculosis. Oh, this warm smoke will be so good for your lungs. And she said it was a slow, insidious poison. You could buy cigarettes from your hospital room in the 50s, and here's a guy in his iron lung. He's got lung problems. They're getting holding cigarettes so he can continue to smoke. And she said insidious. It's a slow, insidious. It's developing so gradually as to be well established before becoming apparent. You see, uh, <laughs> that's tobacco, isn't it? She talked about x-ray. The x-ray came up in the 1800s, and... You could go to the fair for 25 cents in 1900. You could go to the fair and get x-rayed. I wonder what my head looks like. I wonder what my hands look like. For It was a rage. Man, this is science. This is something new. Look what she says. Don't, don't ever use x-ray. No. She's careful with her words. With the visions that she saw, these dreams at night, over 2,000, they believe, about 2,000 visions and dreams she had, wrote 100,000 books. And she says... Uh, okay, to keep it short, we're going to... Okay, well, here's what she said. I have been instructed that x-ray is not the great blessing that some suppose it to be. If used unwisely, it may do much harm. And, you know, they put the lead over you and they put the x-ray thing and they run out of the room and press the button, you know, but she says if it's used unwisely. And uh, this is a picture of Saturn we've been showing this week, and there's the Earth right in front of that arrow. And she had gone to Australia on a ship, and you're looking at weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks to get to Australia in the 1800s on a ship. And when you got home, what would you tell your friends? Boy, all I could see every day was ocean, ocean, every night, every morning, ocean. Boy, this Australia's a long ways away. You know what she said? Because she had seen a picture of the God's universe like we've shown you. Look what she said. It's a little, how big is an atom? Here's what she said. If men could see for a moment beyond the range of finite vision, if they could catch a glimpse of the eternal, every mouth would be stopped in its boasting. Men living on this little atom of a world. She says, Adam, Earth was a little atom compared to God's creation. In the 1800s, you'd have to have a bigger picture, bigger vision of that. It sure looks like it. Smithsonian Magazine. She had a third grade education. She wrote 100,000 pages. She is the world's most translated woman author. The Smithsonian Magazine in 2015 named Ellen G. White among the 100 most significant Americans of all time. The magazine places White in a group that included the likes of Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King Jr., and uh, Helen Keller. Uh, now, the Bible tells us to test the spirits, and she has written this little book, Steps to Christ, been translated 60 million 
copies have been translated. The Bible says, "Test." they confess that Jesus is Lord. And uh, this book, Desire of Ages, is, is another book she's written. So she passes that test. Now, here's what she said. We cannot believe that in the Garden of Eden there were bloodthirsty, ill-tempered, snarling, and vicious creatures. We can't believe that T-Rex was in the Garden of Eden. We can't accept that. We can't believe that. And here's what she says. Here's, the, here's two major statements, and it reveals what we've been covering up this, to this point. And she says, but if there was one sin above another which called for the destruction of the race by a flood, it was the base crime of amalgamation, GMO, genetically modified. Amalgamation, which is a combining of uh, different things, of man and beast which defaced the image of God and caused confusion everywhere. She says that this, what they were doing in the days of Noah and were doing today were defacing the image of God. And she says, the amalgamation of man and beast. Look at the shoulder of a man. Look at the... You see the elbow and the arm and the fingers of a man? When she said man and beast, I think that could be it. Because nobody can explain these tiny little arms on the dinosaur. They're useless. Evolution can't... They have no idea about it. I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, she also said Satan engineered some of the amalgamations using his ingenious methods. Satan was involved in this genetically modify, modification. And then here's what she says. Every species of animal which God created were preserved on the ark. Every species of animal which God created were preserved in the ark. The confused species, those dinosaurs look like confused Confused species, the confused species which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation. We'd say GMO. We didn't have genetics when she wrote this in 18, you know, 155 years ago. She talked, used the word amalgamation. Today we would say GMO, genetically modified, exactly what we're doing today, or hybridization, were destroyed by the flood. So every species that God created were on the ark. The confused species which God did not create, which were the result of GMO were destroyed by the flood. So now you can tell Johnny they were genetically modified. Lizards, ostriches, alligators, crocodiles, all sorts of things. And uh, Leviticus 19, 19, obey my laws, never crossbreed different animals. And she also said there's a, there were a class of very large animals which perished in the flood. I mean, look at the, the, the mammoths and look at some of the things that we, we see today, which are huge. God knew that the strength of man would decrease and the mammoth, that the, these mammoth animals could not be controlled by feeble man. That's what she says. If there was one sin above another, it was this GMO process that was going on. If there was one sin that called for the destruction of the race with a flood... This is in uh, her little books. Um, it's Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 65 and, uh, 64 and 75, uh, where she talks about this. If there was one sin, they're called, I mean, violence. The Bible talks about violence, and these creatures were violent. If there was one sin, it called for the flood. It was this base crime of what's happening today, just before Jesus comes. And that the confused, all the creatures God created were on the ark. The confused species which were not created were not on the ark. So I want to share one other thing with you, since she had written 100,000 pages, what she said about the prodigal son, and we'll end the program. We're not too far off on time, I guess. <laughs> this is amazing. You know, the prodigal son had gone out and spent the family fortune, and he goes like, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, but man, I hate eating pig's food. And my father's, you know, his, his hired people are much better off his, than I am. I'm going to go home, and I'm not worthy to be called your son, but, but uh, let me work as one of your hired people. And you know, that father's watching down that road every day. I don't care what that father's doing, he's looking, is my boy coming home? Is my boy, he's watching down that road every day. Is my boy coming home? And the reason we know that the Bible says that uh, the father met him a great way off. The father went and met that son a great way off. So he's watching for him. He went down, and that's God coming to us. And she talks about this. You know, 
And uh, it's interesting, in the Christ object lesson, she talks about that. And she says, Arise, go to your father. He will meet you a great way off. Take one step toward the Savior. He will enfold you in his arms of love. Never a tear is offered, however, never a prayer is offered, however secret. Never a prayer is offered. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Do you have any faltering prayers? You call the Lord up and put him on hold. You call him up and, 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 and your mind wanders. You call him up to pray to him and uh, you go to sleep. You ever have to apologize? I have to apologize. Lord, forgive me. I called you up and my mind went off somewhere else. And I find I can't pray very well in bed because I go back to sleep. But if I go on the steps and the stairway and I kneel there, then I don't fall asleep. And she says, never a prayer is offered, however faltering, never a tear is shed, however secret, but the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it. And I left out one word. She says, if you take even one step toward the Savior, e is that an important word? Even one step toward the Savior in repentance. He will unfold you in his arms of love. Never a prayer is offered, however secret. Never a tear is shed, how, however faltering. God's going to rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as a party. God's going to have a party when you get to heaven. Now let's look at her exact words. I've been trying to paraphrase it. And here it is. Arise, go to your father. He will meet you a great way off. If you take even one step toward him in repentance, he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of, of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of a contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after God is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a secret desire after God is cherished, however feeble. But the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it. Even before the prayer is uttered or the yearning of the heart made known, grace from Christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul. Your heavenly Father will take from you the garments defiled by sin. That's what she wrote after having a vision, I suppose, about the prodigal son. And that is my presentation on dinosaurs. And we'll have our closing song, number 15, I think. <laughs>